right. Thank you. Um, then I'll be looking out on the screen to see if the other speakers join, and then I can invite them. So uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, session, uh, this afternoon session, uh, which is about emerging best practices in developing cultural, cultural responsive land policies. So as we know, we all know a lot of, of transformation is taking place across Africa. Societies are transforming and so is land use. And the tendency is to prioritize economic interests over cultural heritage. And so the topic of this afternoon discussion actually fits in very well with the AU theme for 2021, which is about cult arts, culture, and heritage. So my expectations from today's discussions is to get a sense from the people that do studies or research to understand how we can manage our land in such a, a way that we balance between our desire for economic development, but at the same time doing so in a manner that protects our culture or does not degrade our culture. So that is really my expectation. And I hope that the presenters, the papers that are going to be presented and discussed can shed some light on what is emerging as best practices or good practices for that matter. So without further ado, I would like to invite Ibrahim to make his presentation. Very well, Chair. Thank you. I was saying that this is a presentation on some research that was done by the Land Development and Governance Institute <clears throat> to test the efficacy of the application of the new community land law in Kenya which was enacted in the year 2016 and given some enabling regulations in uh, 2017. Uh, the, the, the outline is simple, just the background, the methodology, uh, a bit of the activities and findings. Uh, and in the background, uh, uh, Chair, we are sharing the message that uh, Kenya has had um, some statutory tools in the past, which trying to govern the, the management of community land. Uh, and uh, a law called the Trust Land Act and uh, the Land Group Representative Act, both of which did not turn out well. There was a lot of threat to the tenor rights of the, of the community land. And therefore, during deliberations uh, on uh, Kenya's land reform, uh, there was a lot of push that we have a new community land law that would uh, better safeguard the rights of our communities. So uh, following uh, uh, the enactment of our new constitution, we ended up with a new community land law, which is supposed to apply to um, Kenya's community lands, which is to be found in a, prevalently in Northern Kenya. Uh, so in this particular case, we chose some two sites, uh, which are in Northern Kenya. One is in Isiolo uh, County, a county we call Isiolo. And the other is uh, in a county called uh, Marsabit. Uh, in this, you know, we had uh, a community called Garemara. In Marsabit, we had a community called the Walda community. It was a three year study. Uh, and and uh, basically, this uh, presentation is trying to just share some quick highlights on the lessons that we learned from the study. Uh, the methodology is fairly straightforward, was fairly straightforward. We selected the site, we, we sampled some respondents did a number of informant interviews and, uh, uh, and focus group discussions, after which we analyzed the data and also uh, did some report. Uh, Chair, the key activities to this uh, uh, research were involved uh, doing a baseline assessment, just to understand what the leadership uh, issues uh, were like in the community and the governance, governance land governance needs from the community. The, the point was we, try, we, we were trying to ensure that we, we enhance community uh, experience in land governance from the perspective of the, of the new community law. So uh, among other things, you also had to train them to understand the law because we realized there was a sharp uh, gap in uh, understanding the law. 
And thereafter, we also did some uh, participatory exercises of uh, uh, developing bylaws uh, with the community and also uh, ensuring that uh, we, we had that the bylaws peer reviewed. Then we got the community to validate the bylaws. Thereafter, we, we developed some uh, land use planning uh, guides with them and some uh, investor engagement guidelines, basically to be able to empower the community to be able to do their land use planning and also to be able to negotiate with investors whenever uh, there were, the, the opportunity arose. And, and we also tried to train some community champions, people who are identified by the community as the natural leaders able to get the message that we had and uh, accepted by the community itself. So those are some of the uh, products that we ended up with, the, 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 the management room for each of the communities, the bylaws. Uh, some of the pictures uh, as we uh, did the focus group uh, discussions with the, the community, a bit of uh, the uh, baseline assessment uh, with the, the communities in each of the sites. Now in the findings here, uh, we, we noticed uh, that uh, uh, after the pre-assessment that there was a very sharp uh, knowledge gap at the community level and indeed also in some of the government office officers and, and the leaders who are meant to work with the communities in, uh, in, in, in implementing the new land law. Uh, and therefore, uh, and, and that was the reason we had to embark on uh, uh, the empowerment of the, com the community so they may understand the law and the regulations that are required that, that, that drive that law. Uh, we also uh, realized that because we involved the community strongly in developing whatever product that we, 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 we worked on with them, they, they, they were very easily able to galvanize uh, into action and, 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 and meet uh, some of the requirements under the law. Uh, we, also, we also realized that uh, after they realized from the involvement that uh, indeed there was nothing subtle, there was nothing and what about the new law, they got very eager to protect the rights to their, uh, their land uh, through the, the, the methods uh, prescribed under the Act. So they are very eager to get their land rights registered as uh, provided for in the Act. And, they have, and, and we also realized that uh, as they did the, the, the land use uh, uh, guides and the investor engagement uh, guides, they began to see that this, in fact, were, 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 were tools that were going to empower them for purposes of their future. So they did it with a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, what, what I'll say um, uh, uh, goodwill and, and interest, uh, and, and and also one of the other things I share that we realize is that um, the the champions we trained for them appeared to be coming in very handy whenever we were not there uh, with the community because they provide they close the gap whenever we were away from uh, the research site. And therefore, as I close at the lessons that we, uh, we, we, we leave behind, uh, I think uh, uh, participants can be able to look at the details in the, in, the, in the presentation, in the actual full paper, that it is important whenever you are doing a thing like this, particularly for government uh, officials who are going to be responsible for implementation of new frameworks that are geared towards working with communities, be able to do pre-assessment so that you understand the, 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 the knowledge gap or otherwise at the county uh, level, that is the government uh, uh, local level, and at the community grassroots level. Uh, and, and we also noticed one of the uh, easy tools uh, was the, the use of uh, vernacular language, that whereas in Kenya we assume Kiswahili works for all communities, we, we noticed that when we went down to the use of uh, 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 interpretation, using the vernacular language and interpreting to Kiswahili, uh, the participation got even more robust. We also appreciated that the community uh, got uh, uh, more and more comfortable when we empowered them with the provisions of the new law and the regulations. And they were very comfortable when we involved them in actually drawing up from the lessons that they have been using traditionally uh, and aligning them with the provisions of the new law. It was important we noticed that uh, the, 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 the communities are no problem with accepting uh, gender parity in land governance and indeed, uh, the more we work with them in a participatory manner, the more confident the, the, the women leaders who are in the committees that we created became. It was also obvious that uh, the youth have a very major role to play in the sense that they are energetic and they are willing. They look at the future, at the, at, at, at the land rights as their future. So they were extremely forthcoming in our, in our research and uh, we, we, we then uh, 
flag that as, as necessary when people want to implement uh, frameworks with communities. And uh, the, 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 there's also the importance of using community, empowering some community champions so that when research groups or even government groups for that matter move out of sight, then the communities are able to thereafter continue with the, with, 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 with the, with the implementation as intended. And finally, Chair, um, it is uh, also important to flag the fact that in, in doing what we are, we are supposed to be doing with the Community Land Act in Kenya, we, can, we could very easily sell the impression that, uh, that, uh, that, 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 that because the community has registered land rights, then they have got good reason to, to close out uh, 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 wildlife corridors and also close out grazing rights from other communities. A very tricky scenario if indeed that, that result was, was realized. So it's important to note that risk. So as I conclude, I just want to uh, indicate that when we implement new frameworks within our, our country, uh, our country spaces and with the grassroots uh, communities, it is always important to understand that you need to empower the community to understand the law, you need to involve them, uh, and you also need to ensure that uh, uh, you take the lessons like in the case that we were on, we noticed that there are some challenges in the use of the law in the sense that when uh, a lady is married uh, into a community and divorces uh, and acquires rights on, on marriage, that, but then divorces, then you have a, you have a gap in how to handle her afterwards. Uh, and, and, and finally, I've also talked about the, the, the need to beware the negative impacts of uh, registering land uh, where the a community may begin to see that as a, as a right to close out uh, corridors and other, other people from using their land. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Ibrahim, um, for your presentation and also for keeping within the time um, allocated. Thank you so much, much, uh, much appreciated. And the message is very clear um, that laws may be very well intended, but unless they are understood by the communities and explained to them in the language that they understand, there may be misgivings or misunderstandings about, um, about the law, but when they do understand and also involvement of the community leaders and champions, um, it removes a lot of barriers and misunderstandings that may exist. That is the key message that I, that I picked out and also involvement of the youth themselves. So thank you so much, uh, um, Ibrahim, for that presentation. So now we'll go to the uh, next presentation. Good afternoon to you too, or good morning wherever you are, if you are in Washington or elsewhere where it's morning. It's wonderful to be here at this uh, important conference. Your Excellences, distinguished panelists and guests uh, attending from all over the world. Uh, this is an important topic on land governance for safeguarding art and culture and heritage toward, towards the Africa we want. And I'm going to be talking about architecture on cultivating um, African architecture for the Africa we need. Um, I stumbled across this important um, quote, uh, African proverb, which says that uh, knowledge is a garden. Uh, if it's not cultivated, it cannot be harvested. I believe that when it comes to architecture, this is exactly what's happening, that African architecture need to be um, really harvested because the knowledge is there. Uh, given the challenges such as COVID-19, which has highlighted the usage of space and climate change, which raises questions on how structures are designed and made. So there is an important uh, reason to really consider how African architecture can play a meaningful role in shaping the Africa we need, not to mention contributing to sustainable global architecture. Yeah, I, I argue that land uh, is often not needed for its own sake. Uh, we need land normally for something else, and that's where architecture is crucial. But what is architecture? Now, there are many, many uh, definitions of architecture, but you know we won't be able to go through them. Um, but some of them are like the two I have here, which the first one says architecture is a discipline where you can have multivariate interests. You could be a philosopher, a geographer, a scientist, an artist, an engineer, you can be poetic about it. And that's according to Toshiko Mori. 
But uh, Francis Kelly, one of our leading African architects, suggests that ar architecture is not just about building, it's a means of improving people's quality of life. Now, I came up with three case, case studies. One is by Demas Noko, a Nigerian artist and architect. The one goes to Kominte, the Mazab Valley in Algeria. And the third um, comes back here to Washington, D.C., where I am now. Uh, it's, and it's about the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art, Afri African American History and Culture. Now, Demas Noko, some of you may know him. He was born in Nigeria in 1935. And among the things he does is the, what is called um, nitrothensis. And this is the idea that you can get um, local traditional ideas and mix them with influences from the West or elsewhere, which are useful. And he developed this in 1958 when he, together and other students, formed the Zaire Art Society. Uh, Noko's structures are a model of not only cultural relevant but also sustainable design are uh, things we need, especially in this uh, age of climate change. Now, the Mazab Valley is, is a wonderful example to show how um, actually people have used, been using common uh, local knowledge and local materials to uh, really build their communities. And it was founded in the early uh, 11th century by the Mosaic Babas. In 1982, um, UNESCO made the Mazab Valley a world heritage site uh, uh, for its sim simple, functional, and perfectly adaptable environment kind of architecture, uh, which is designed uh, for community living, while also respecting the structure of the family. And indeed, for today's urban planners, the place continues to be a source of inspiration. One of our, our important uh, pieces of architecture in that valley is the a clay palace of Gardia, which uses clay and local material for reasons which um, I think are evident, partly because it's, for example, they have not needed to repair that place for more than a thousand years, and also it absorbs heat well, uh, especially in a place which is really as hot as the Sahara Desert. There's a video there, and people may be able to see it later, but because we don't have time, we won't be able to uh, play the video. Uh, but, you know, I say that um, African architecture is indeed beyond architecture, it is beyond Africa, and um, the noetic feats of African architecture are not indeed limited just to Africa. And the African American Museum in Washington, D.C. Uh, just shows that. Uh, the project was established in 2003 and completed in 2016, but it goes way back to the 1950s. And architects were like uh, conductors, master improvisers. They did quite remarkable ways to how to make the building not only just uh, looking great, but also quite relevant. And Adai, um, David Adai, some of them, some of you may know who he is, was quite responsible uh, to making sure we have this African connection. And Adai found this African uh, sculpture by Wally, which you can see here, which influenced the design of a building. And this is an early sketch of a building. And uh, Wally um, uh, is uh, an early 20th century Yoruba craftsman. And as you see, the uh, sculpture, the kind of zogarit it has in there also shows up here in the building. And that um, uh, uh, image there is linked, so people who may have uh, the slide uh, if, could go there and link and learn more about it. Uh, now, the word ziggurat, it turns out, means a sense of uplift, which also I, I think is also highlighted in Olowe's work. But those three tiered crowns also have um, some kind of structure behind them, in that the building is about the history and present and future. and. But although the history really chronicles uh, slavery, that does not really take away what it presents and the future it radiates, which is a future of um, light. Now, this is the first uh, green museum on the mall in the United States, but actually more African influences do not just stay uh, with uh, all always structures. The welcoming porch also have African architecture roots, across the African diaspora. 
and also uh, when a die wrapped an entire building <coughs> in an uh, ornamental bronze colored metal lotus it was really paying homage to the african americans um formerly enslaved who uh were uh, gifted um crops people in this kind of work and now as i was doing research i actually found that americans maybe were already paying homage to african architecture when they made their uh, president a monument based on obelisk um which you can see there and this kind of architecture actually comes uh from africa now on policy recommendations as i conclude it turns out the greek uh, philosopher Aristoteles used an obelisk to actually to calculate the Earth's, Earth, Earth's circumference. This was in 2050 BC. Now, I argue that the first policy we need to do is to appreciate Africa's past as we appreciate, as we really try to shape its future. And as the Iowa Art Society did, we just need to elevate our African arts in the curriculum. Uh, here, I believe the uh, private sector indeed has a role to play, but governments indeed also have a, a huge role and responsibility to play. And I believe that they can help shape the cu curriculum uh, to promote African architecture. Uh, they can provide African uh, scholarships and things like that. But also, I believe that there's a, um, a need for government agencies to work in an integrated manner. If I'm not mistaken, I think many ministries or agencies are still working in silos and i think it's important to see how we can integrate all this for example you can have urban planning work with the minister of culture with the minister of education land and survey to determine how best to integrate african architecture and indeed the arts into our education system meanwhile schools themselves have a role to play because they are basically um, custodians of knowledge and on social issues, uh, when it comes to involving women, I think that's important because as Sarah Wigglesworth said, architecture is too important to be left to men alone. And when we talk of also young people, one could argue that architecture is too important not to involve young people. But how can these groups uh, be recruited and retained? I argue one of the ways is to fight is to provide architectural fellowships, but also one thing which is hugely important, and I note this in the paper, um, is to create ways of how we can have mentorships, and some of the people who could be mentors in that group are listed there. Um, and but finally, and perhaps most important, there is a need to get rid of the idea of seeing African architecture as African as uncivilized. And I conclude by saying that African architecture, again, is like a garden that can feed Africa and the world with ideas. But except for a few isolated cases, it has yet to be fully cultivated and harvested. But again, if land usage is paramount, and if the arts, culture, and heritage are needed to build the Africa we need, then there is a need to take African architecture seriously in land policy. And with that, um, thank you so much. I had to rush through this, but I hope the message got out somehow. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Kabanda, for your presentation. And yes, indeed, the, the messages came out, at least those that I was able to, to pick. Um, we need to preserve our culture through architecture. And we examine Africa's past to shape the continent's future. Yes. And also, we need to look at educational curricula to incorporate yes. culture into um, modern African architecture among the many messages that you, you provided. So thank you so much for your presentation. And now um, I would like to request Heba if Heba, you are ready for with your presentation, you can also make it now. I'll try to I'll try to share it on her behalf. Let me try. This is Kimani Njogu. Thank you so much. And yes, uh, Kimani, also to save ahead. time, you can you can run it from the seventh uh, minute. Uh, basically, the beginning is uh, an introduction of the history of uh, 
Libya in working in urban plans since uh, 1960 and the, 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 the levels, the first time, the second time, and the third, which they call the third generation. And all of this stopped during the, the 2011 uh, political situation. It, can you hear it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So Heba recommended that you start it at the seventh minute. Yes, it's the methodology because the, the, the paper basically is uh, doing the round table that uh, collects all the people, all stakeholders that are working on land in Libya. And from the seventh, uh, the minute seven, it will present the methodology and uh, the findings and also the recommendations from the round table. Buildings uh, and unregulated spread of informal settlements. Uh, due to uh, all of this big background, it becomes obvious that uh, the land is an issue in Libya, and uh, therefore uh, this issue need to be addressed and uh, uh, solutions need to be uh, recommended and then action. Uh, therefore, a round table on addressing the land administration and land rights challenges to pave the ground for peace and stability in Libya was organized by UN Habitat on 29 30th June in Tunis, Tunisia. The event gathered over 30 representatives from Libyan government bodies, UN, and representatives from INGOs, civil society organizations, and the private sector. The land government uh, organization and institutions are, the main four are, the Libyan Urban Planning Authority, the Libyan Public Property Authority, the Real Estate Registration Authority, and the Libyan Surveying Authority. For uh, the international organizations are UN Habitat and Norwegian Refugees Council in Libya, and for the Libyan Academ Academia is uh, Benghazi University, private sector uh, is Dar as Salam Engineering Consultancy Company, and for Tunisia, uh, UN Habitat uh, in Tunisia as well. Uh, the round table provided a platform for share ideas and discuss the importance of land management and land tenure security for achieving sustainable peace and stability in Libya and their function, uh, fundamental role in the economic development of the country. Uh, the other is understand the existing land issues and their impacts on the border Libyan priorities. Example, social and economic, economic development, peace and reconciliation, reconstruction, state building and institutional strengthening and promotion of human rights. then work toward the development of, of common vision and discuss the priorities for action in the Libya land and HLB sector. Thank you so much, Ali. The floor now is to Umbretta Tempra to discuss the finding and the recommendations. The floor is used. Thank you so much, Eba. Thank you, Ali. Um, so at the round table there were different topics discussed uh, and uh, some of the more uh, stringent findings uh, were the following um, the really urgency of looking at the land registration system uh, which uh, you know is affected by li limited cadastral coverage uh, procedures which are lengthy and bureaucratic and most importantly a freeze of land registration that is in place since 2011 as my colleague Ali was explaining before. Um, the need of having a better management of the public assets 
because um, there are gaps in archiving the information, uh, monitoring the encroachments on public uh, properties, and also a need to have a better way of valuing uh, the properties uh, with a better uh, valuation system. Um, Land-based land taxation needs to be introduced. Uh, it's not really well regulated at the moment, and revenues are not sufficiently collected. Uh, this not only uh, you know, limits the resources that are available for local authorities to introduce services and infrastructures, but also distorts the land market. Uh, there is a need of looking at land expropriation and compensation legislation because it has some significant gaps that affect the protection of rights of the most vulnerable, uh, but also uh, how uh, you know these tools are used for uh, urban development in general. Uh, need to look at how land disputes are resolved. Um, so understanding better what typology of land disputes are there and uh, what type of disputes are uh, also generated by historical injustices that might have been there already before 2011. Uh, then um, looking at the improvement of the legal system overall related to land, acknowledging the fact that there is a lot of good legislation already in place, but uh, maybe uh, they need to be consolidated, some of them up and uh, the fragmentation needs to be reduced. Uh, and then uh, also the aspect of human resources available to uh, work in the land sector needs to be looked at. There are at the moment insufficient capacities, uh, also because of the many people have left during the conflict and therefore the need of working together to have better uh, human resources available to work in the land sector. Next. Uh, in terms of recommendation, uh, this is really in the short term, uh, you know, going forward. Uh, UN Habitat is conducting an assessment of land administration and land rights to look at some of these aspects a bit more in detail uh, with interviews, focus group discussion and uh, desk review of the existing document. Uh, definitely, we are will be working to mobilize financial and technical resources to lift the land administration, land rights agenda. Uh, and then uh, to develop a program that can actually look at land administration overall with uh, like seven priorities. Uh, one is the reform of the legal and the regulatory framework uh, related to land. The second one is streamlining uh, the land registration processes uh, that are in place um, because there is a gap there and we need to embrace fit for purpose land administration approaches that can make this process more affordable and faster and effective uh, and scalable. Uh, uh, looking at piloting uh, land registration intervention in some uh, context from where lessons can be learned for replication, upscaling and institutionalization. Uh, looking at how to improve property taxation uh, and work towards a lift of the land registration freeze that is really a priority um, uh, because this affects really the investments going uh, into the land sector, especially in urban areas, and it also makes difficult for to individuals or companies or private uh, sector to um, to ask for loans to finance finance their investments. So this is really one of the priorities of the international communities and of the national actor at the moment. Uh, and then looking at the land, dis uh, the land dispute resolution component and capacity development. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, there is the need of encouraging, keep encouraging the joint work between institutions with land related mandates and develop a new generation of plans to direct sustainable development at the different levels, uh, local level, uh, regional level and national level. Uh, because this is an important, um, there are important tools to direct sustainable development uh, where Libyan invested a lot and developed significant capacities and now there is the need of taking them forward for, uh, for the future. Um, to conclude, uh, it's important that actually uh, 
uh, humanitarian and development actors join effort to improve land administration and housing land and property rights in Libya because this is really the foundation for uh, social economic development but also peace stability and rebuilding Libya uh, to emerge from the fragility where it is now uh, and uh, and uh, I would like to to invite all of you to have a look at the, at the full documentation from the round table with more information on the Arab Land Initiative website. Thank you very much for your attention and, um, and looking forward to, to your questions and contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, um, Heba, for sharing that presentation. And also we thank in absentia uh, Ombreta Tempra for uh, uh, making the recording available to uh, the audience today. So we are remaining with exactly 20 minutes to conclude this session. And I just checked, I do not see Professor Helmi. Uh, is there somebody who is going to make a presentation on, on his behalf? If not, uh, we can use the remaining time to get some questions or comments on the three presentations that were made. So we have had um, three presentations so far. The first one by Ibrahim Mwadhani on the Community Land Act 2017 of Kenya. Then we had uh, Patrick Kabanda talking about cultivating Africa's uh, architecture. And now we just had a presentation on land administration and land rights in Libya. So if you have a question or comment, um, I invite you to raise your hand and I will recognize you. But when you do so, please keep your comment or question very short so that we can accommodate as many uh, people as possible. So the floor is open for questions or comments. And if you are asking a question, please uh, indicate to whom the question is directed. Thank you. Yes, I recognize James Chakwizira. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, directed to Professor Patrick uh, Kabada. You spoke very well about uh, African architecture and uh, Renaissance. What I want to find out from you is do you have some few classical modules which integrate you know, traditional uh, architecture with vernacular or African architecture, which can act as models or mirrors for other regions to incorporate and infuse this very important and vital African uh, you know, architecture, which has not been given the prominence that it deserves. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you so much, uh, James. Uh, the question is very clear. So, uh, Patrick, first wait, let's uh, see if I have other hands, and then we'll give the, the presenters a chance to respond. So, let me first take a few more hands, and then I will let you go and respond. So, do we have other comments or questions? Okay, as you think about your, your question, um, um, Patrick, if you can respond to, to James. Yes, um, thank you, James, for that question. Yes, um, and again, apologies for um, saying everything, I think, at a faster tempo than I intended, but I believe that you do have the PowerPoint um, a presentation loaded here and also, I think, the abstract and the full paper itself. I go into detail, but indeed, those uh, three case studies are models uh, NOKO in Nigeria is indeed using African traditional architecture, vernacular architecture, to try to build uh, architecture which reflects um, not only culture, 
but sustainable uh, ways of building. For example, now one of the things I see that sand is becoming very scarce. We have to find a way of how we can build buildings without using resources like sand. Uh, things like water and all uh, uh, kind of um, sometimes what may be called imported materials are sometimes not the way we can go forward in that in vernacular architecture we have ways we can actually you know try to make more inclusive architecture for everyone now the Mazab Valley the reason I think why it was made um, a world heritage site is precisely what I think James's question was and there's a video in there in the PowerPoint I was unfortunately not able to to play it but you can look at the video from UNESCO to give you a broader idea and also it's a model of how can you find this very harsh environment and actually make it livable in a sustainable way and finally um, the example of Washington this is the African American Museum that's indeed African influenced in that you saw the um, Zagarot, um, the three crowns coming way from Nigeria from all the way <coughs> um, of Ise. So these I think are useful examples but also in one of the things which I think I put in the recommended readings for the paper in Zambia I think Zimbabwe I heard that there is an architect who has gone and looked at what we call ant hills or um, basically termite hills and use that as an example because these are common in many places of, in Africa and how can you use that as a way of air conditioning because these ants are able to actually find a way to create little poles in these ant hills to sort of make the ant hill instead of um, basically cool so how can that inform uh, new architecture so I think um, all these examples I think quote African or what we have on the continent just to elevate it and put it uh, to use today. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. J just for my, my, no, uh, for my information, what is vernacular architecture in a few words? Oh, vernacular architecture is like saying, um, or I don't know which country you're coming from. For example, if you say you are going to Uganda and you speak Luganda, <laughs> that would be a vernacular language. In that, if our ancestors were using uh, thatched huts or using clay or mud and trying to build the way they build, is what you may call a vernacular architecture. I hope that answers it. <laughs> yes. So, okay, it, it helps me uh, to, to, to appreciate what, what vernacular architecture is. Why don't you call it traditional architecture? Yes, the terminology uh, can, and I don't know if I mentioned this in the paper, some people may call it indigenous architecture and some people may call it um, traditional architecture and some people may call it vernacular architecture but as you may know dr george academics sometimes may <laughs> if you go with definitions we may be here all day so sometimes i just use this just to uh, go with what i think is commonly um, basically understood or used but indeed it can be also called traditional architecture we are right on on that yes Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, yes. Let me see if I have any other hand. Um, I don't. So does anybody have a, a comment or question? We still have uh, 12 minutes to go um, on this session. And I see, I see there are some comments in the, in the chat box. Um, yeah. So I see James is saying, thanks, Pat, uh, Professor Patrick Cavanda for the insights. I concur with the scope mm. uh, for the full value of African architecture can still be optimized with full value, with full value chain for economic growth and development. Many thanks, greatly appreciated. So there is appreciation to you, Patrick, for um, your presentation and response to the question. Yes, thank you. Yes. Um, so I do not see any other um, person wishing to take the floor. So perhaps we could end the session. Oh, okay. Now I see there is Stan Stanislas Bigirimana. So Stanislas, you may take the floor. Yes, I want to come again on the theme of uh, terminology, uh, traditional picture, vernacular, some people use uh, 
indigenous. So those, in my view, are a very complicated concepts because uh, there are concepts which emerge as Africans as we try to compare ourselves to other people. It's mainly in contrast with um, European um, modernity, which um, through very complex processes has uh, managed to impose itself to other continents as a, a standard and uh, a, a model. So even when we said African architecture, it's still very difficult because Africa also is uh, modernizing itself. And one may ask whether even the skyscrapers we see in Africa now are not part of African architecture. I have got this problematic that uh, when we, what we call traditional African or vernacular is linked to the past, as if what you are doing now, like now, uh, I'm mainly in IT. So for me, software is software, as long as it works, whether it is Chinese, African, or Asian. So I don't know in the architecture, if the building is strong and it can fulfill what people have built it for, I'm start wondering why we start bringing in um, those characterization. It is as if we are somehow displaying a certain inferiority complex and trying to state that we also have what other people have. If they have architecture, we also have architecture. It doesn't have to be African traditional vernacular. Architecture is the uh, architecture, in, in my view, depending on what you want to do with the building. Thank you. Yes, Stanislas, thank you for raising that comment. Of course, it can be controversial, but, but I think you are right that we, if we are looking at African architecture, um, why do we have to look at tradition to characterize it as African architecture? You can have a modern African uh, designing a modern building skyscraper and it should still be African architecture. But I will, still, um, I will give Patrick a floor to respond after or to comment or any other person, but let me first give Nsama Chikolwa um, the floor. Nsama? Uh, thank you, Doc. Um, I hope you can hear me clearly. No, Nsama, we cannot hear you. Um, it's difficult to hear you, Nsama. So I'll go to the, um, the last presentation about uh, Libya and Sama, we cannot hear you what you are saying. Maybe you can check your connection. Even now, I can hear. We cannot hear what you are saying in summer. So check your connection and you come back. You can come back. Yes, you can use the chat box to ask your question or, or make the comment. As, as you do so, um, if uh, Patrick, you may want to, to uh, respond very quickly to, to Stanislas or comment on what Stan, Stanislas uh, um, talked about. Patrick? Yes, uh, Stanislas, thank you for um, your question. Uh, in fact, what we are saying is exactly what Noko is doing. What we are not saying, there's truly no, for example, in Uganda we have um, chapati and samosas. If I'm not mistaken, those come from, I think, mostly India, but this has become part of our African food. In England, chicken tikka masala has become almost a national food. Yet it comes <laughs> all the way from, uh, from India. What would be a mistake you say that, oh, don't eat that food, it's, it's substandard uh, because it comes from India. That's basically what we're going. And when they are cooking it, they are also maybe infusing English uh, ways of cooking. So I think that's what we are going um, on. Noko, I think um, in the paper I described this, and also in the article I cite about the interview with him, he really describes that we can take all good ideas we can find, and then infuse them with some of our traditional ways of living. Now, what must be noted is that most time, for example, Western consumption right now, or individual living, is not sustainable in many ways. And we have some of our traditional ways of community living, like, like in the Mazab Valley, we can actually infuse in modern architecture. 
In Washington DC, they never went to Nigeria or Uganda or South Africa or Egypt to import a sand. They probably used materials from here in America or elsewhere. But the ideas came <laughs> from Africa. So the idea itself can be part of this. It would be a shame to say that let's get rid of Luganda and actually this has happened or Swahili or Congolese because we can now just use English. There are some words or concepts you cannot understand in English or French <laughs> and we must preserve these languages and that's why I believe what this uh, conference is all about. I hope that answers your question, Stanley. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for your views, Patrick. Thank you so much. Um, yes, so we are remaining with five minutes. Um, and Sama had wanted to make a comment or ask a question, but she has not yet typed it. Um, yes. So any other person that would like to, I'm going to give one last chance before we close the session. Okay. I, yes. Uh, Heba. Hello. Yes, go ahead, oh, Heba. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing the presentation and for the event and all for the for all the technical support and the exciting presentation. I, I would just like to highlight a point uh, concerning uh, Dr. Patrick's presentation. We also in Egypt have this uh, debate on uh, what we need to focus on or to raise. Is it the culture? Is it the old? Or we need to like formulate our new culture? It's not just grabbing what's old or what's ancient and see this is Egyptian. We, the current generations, need to have their own culture, which is a mix of the old and the new, and formulate it and show it in their own way. And maybe this could also be called the like Egyptian culture and Egyptian uh, architect or Egyptian urban clustering. Uh, it's, it's, I think this debate is, is, is in all the Arab and African countries now because there are a lot of copying from outside, but uh, it's also very important for us, the practitioners and uh, researcher to highlight this point and uh, to raise it and discuss it more. Thank you so much. Heba, and you are the last one to make this uh, to make a comment. So, with this, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to thank you so much for participating in today's session, um, especially our three presenters: Ibrahim Wadane on the Community Land Act of Kenya in 2017, uh, Patrick Kabanda emphasizing the need to cultivate Africa's architecture towards the Africa we want, and then. Um, on Breta Tempura, represented here by, by Heba on land administration and land rights in, in, in Libya. It's been a very rich discussion, and I hope you have taken away some useful lessons, especially in light of the topic about emerging uh, practices, emerging practices um, on the developing culturally responsive land rights, uh, land policies, sorry, um, in Africa. So I hope you have enjoyed the session. And with that, I want to thank you again for your participation and to the organizers of the session for the hard work that, you, that went into organizing this particular session. So thank you so much. And as your chair, I now sign off and have a good afternoon. <laughs>